Okay, I think I've conquered the technical uh, challenges. And um, so, yes, welcome to uh, this evening's Central Korean Studies seminar. Uh, my name is Owen Miller. Some of you may know me. I'm uh, a lecturer here at SOAS and a member of the Central Korean Studies. And um, yeah, so I'm excited that we have a very interesting talk today by uh, Eric Kramer, who um, is a uh, a modern historian and historian of science and technology, is that correct to say yeah. that? Yeah. And um, yeah, Eric did his PhD at Toronto and has since been a postdoc at Cambridge, right, at the Newton Institute, which is maybe some of you know, one of the sort of world famous institute for history of, sort of East Asian science. And, uh, and now he has a new post at University of Sheffield. So he has become a uh, sort of, yeah, Prisoner of the British <laughs> Islands. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so a very interesting topic. I'm just going to leave it to you to talk for about, you know, uh, 50 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for a couple of some discussion after that. So yeah, please. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for um, coming tonight. Thank you, Aung, for the introduction. Uh, yes, indeed, I'm following a statement of the British Isles now, which I would never expect that I was in Cambridge, and I thought, oh, this is all quite mosaic, but I'm going to leave now, and I'll never come back. And then um, by the grace of God and of good faith and just dumb luck, I got a job at Sheffield. And so it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, and I have to say, as someone who's been in East Asian studies for um, more years than I'd like to basically publicize, um, one is always encountering folks from SOAS, PhD students and researchers, uh, folks who leave an impression. And uh, to finally be able to be here and to speak with you is a considerable uh, point of pride for me. Um, which I don't think you can understand being inside of this sort of echo chamber, but um, it is indeed a great privilege. Thank you for coming. So um, today what we'll be doing is, um, you know, I'm, I'm properly, as a, as a you know, proper Democrat, I want to give us an agenda that we can follow to and just notice that we're not going to vote on it. I'm mandating it. It's what we're going to be doing. Um, I'll give you an overview of my research and we'll talk a little bit about how what I'm presenting on today specifically early Korean accounts of the atomic bombings and their erasure in the immediate context of post-liberation North and South Korea fits into a broader study that I'm conducting right now on the early histories of the atomic age in North and South Korea within the context of the Cold War and the post-colonial world. Okay, So there'll be a project overview, then we'll sort of jump into the context of the specific case study, early Korean accounts of the atomic age. We'll go through uh, three different manifestations or, or, or ways of discussing the atomic attacks um, in Korea in the post-45 context, accounts of liberation through the bombings, stories of this thing called science war, which we'll elaborate on, and then uh, this kind of surviving the present, the specific temporalities and challenges to these aforementioned accounts that are posed by Korean atomic bomb survivors themselves. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, what I'll be presenting on today is part of a bigger book project called A New Kind of Energy, Atomic Science in the Cold War Koreas, 1945 uh, to 1965. This project um, is an attempt to do a number of, of different things. One is to emphasize the fusions between the atomic, post-colonial, and Cold War eras. Um, often when we talk about these things, we kind of book, we kind of bookend each of them. And uh, one of the things I try to emphasize in this particular book project is the ways in which ideas about liberation are leading into ideas about the Cold War, how ideas about the Cold War are being decisively shaped by ideas about the atomic age, that these conversations are happening not only contemporaneously, but also that they're informing each other self-referentially. Okay? Um, I'm, in this book, I'm trying to discuss the Cold War as a techno-scientific event, so again, often when we're talking about the Cold War, we think about maybe ideological contestation between liberalism and socialist ideologies, or maybe we're thinking about power politics, right? That often manifests itself today when we say like, is it a new Cold War, right? That we have different states, uh, di different, um, how to say, uh, different um, um, uh, hegemonic formations that are just normatively within tension with one another, kind of a realist understanding of geopolitics, right? That's another way that we conventionally understand the Cold War. Um, what I'm suggesting in, in, my, in my project here is that the Cold War itself is being informed specifically by ideas about the atomic age and the, the new forms of thinking that are introduced 
by what seems to be a revolution in energy. Note that it seemed to be a revolution in energy, one that didn't quite manifest itself. And then finally, uh, the, what I'm doing in this larger project is looking at um, the contest for the sovereignty of science. So, um, you know, that sounds a little bit wonky, but essentially um, what, what I want to explore is how, you know, uh, Cold War science isn't just a competition to go to the moon or to build a better rocket or to um, build the internet first. Cold War science and the competition over science is an attempt to define that field itself, to say that liberal science substantively, theoretically, is the real science, or that a science based in socialism is the actual proper normative and universal type of science. Okay, So it's not just about inventing stuff, making stuff. It's about defining stuff. And um, if that sounds interesting to you, um, maybe one day read my book after I've written it. I haven't done any of this stuff yet, right? So it's just a pitch, a pitch for something that you can't even buy. But um, it, it might be helpful to just understand how this chapter is fitting into broader projects that I have underway. Ah, atomic Age renders ideas. So before I sort of said, you know, we have this new era. Um, maybe some of you know the term Cold War. Does anyone know where it came from? Cold War, that term. Who first coined it? I think it's your countrymen. Well, if you're from this island, it's your countrymen. Okay. Not my countrymen. <laughs> fine, fine. I don't want to get all. I'm fine. <laughs> don't be all like. Yeah, I'm sorry to suggest that. Yeah, you come from this island, but um, so Orange Orwell, right? It's Orwell. Orwell. Orwell writes an essay in September of 1945 called "View in the Atomic Bomb," and he coins the term Cold War. Right? It spreads from there. Um, a contribution, I guess, to global culture. Right? It's, it's a specific reaction to a techno-scientific event connected to a bunch of other ideas of, of state formation, of empire. Right? We don't have to go into it, but um, it's an illustration of the broader thing that I'm trying to identify, which is, which is how this new era is informing ideas in Korea, ideas about national liberation, ideas about historical revolution, ideas of war. Right? Famously, the Korean War is the first limited war. Now, for anyone who knows the kind of empirical history of the Korean War, that's a pretty wacky thing to say, right? You know, <laughs> flying B-29s over Pyongyang and just devastating the entire city doesn't seem limited. But it is limited within the context of this new other form of war, which is atomic war, right? Um, atomic energy and its, its ways of thinking about energy writ large, right? Energy revolutions. And then finally, broader ideas about development. Um, these are the kind of broader themes that I hope to explore, that I am exploring my research. I guess if that's interesting to you, you can like look up the stuff I've written and read it and post it and cite it. And yeah, build a little shrine to me in your study. You know, <laughs> don't, don't do any of those things. Um, okay, so let's, let's sort of take a step back from the realm of like academic projection. A lot of that stuff I'd like to do and done some of it, but haven't really followed through and go to uh, what, um, was advertised today, which was early Korean accounts of the atomic age. Um, so th this is the product of a paper that I was um, able to publish in the Journal of Asian Studies uh, a few months ago, which means that it was a product of collaboration and um, a product of really uh, helpful review processes. So whatever I advertise here is a, is a collaborative outcome. The mistakes are mine, of course, though. Um, <laughs> so we'll start our story um, of, of these uh, we'll start a story with these three individuals. Okay. So um, in October 1945, these three scientists, Itaeku, Pak Chaute, and Sungi, took the train to Hiroshima. Their visit was part of a larger, larger pilgrimage by researchers in Japan to the recently irradiated city that stood as a point of demarcation in global science. Months later, following the repatriation of each three of these researchers to Seoul, an account of, of the trio's trips of trip to Hiroshima was published in one of Seoul's new, um, new popular science magazines. And, and I have a picture, I have a picture of that magazine here. Written by Pop de la it includes this quote, the unleashing of the atom is revolutionary, not simply because the particle is cut in two, but because of the enormous energy that's released in doing so. Now, Puck's account is quite curious because although he goes to the city, although one of his travel companions 
uh, went to high school in Hiroshima, and although they saw the devastation firsthand, Hawk's attention is overwhelmingly focused on this point right here, the revolutionary potential that is offered by this new type of technology. Not so much the devastation, not so much the loss, but the possibilities that this new technology um, held. Hoptote's anticipation over the transformative potential of the atomic attacks fit well with the forward-looking character of the day. After decades of Japanese rule, the colonial peninsula unexpectedly encountered the promises and perils of the Cold War, decolonization, and division. So uh, at the risk of being a little repetitive, one of the points I'm trying to establish in my research are the ways that for writers and translators who are dealing with the subject of the bombings at this time, the atomic age and post-colonial era were not just contemporaneous chapters, of modern history, but that they fused into a common mode of articulating political and historical transformation. Amalgamated in this way, early Korean accounts of the recently aged, ended Asia-Pacific War fixated on the liberatory utility of atomic weapons, with intellectuals suggesting causal linkages between science, conflict, and progress. Writers working in this vein thought to sit tried to stage the bombings as an instance of rev resolution that prefaced a new era of both national and global history. However, by advancing this story of liberation, they also concealed narratives and temporalities of the repatriated survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki attacks, those Korean bomb survivors, right? Their voices are getting lost in this overwhelming anticipation for liberation through a new era of energy. Um, you know, I argue in my article that this is a significant act of erasure. Experiences of Korean atomic bomb victims often undermine the political lines ascribed to the end of empire and resisted a sense of rupture assigned to the post-liberation period. However, rather than take up the challenge to the future posed by these individuals, writers and translators from across the Cold War divide tended to sidestep the stark violence of the attacks in their aftermath. In doing so, Korean intellectuals participated in the omission of colonial subjects from the story of the bombings, relegating their active and critical anxieties of that group to the past. Okay, I'm sorry for reading that. It's really boring. I hate it when presenters read from their papers, but th this is kind of the analytical intervention that I want to make. So for like the specialists in the room who are super duper interested in this topic, maybe that's of edification to you. For others, I, like if you're not interested in hearing my voice read my own work, then I, I apologize. In essence, my argument is, is really simple. People are so excited about reform and revolution that they don't want to hear any other story. And there's no space for other stories. Um, and this is a bit of an intervention in broadly how we think about the erasure of Korean atomic bomb survivors from the story of the atomic attacks. Right? Um, so literature on this topic has generally focused on what has been called the nationalization of the atomic bomb experience, the ways in which um, the Japanese state, in some cases encouraged um, also by, by the Americans, structured the story of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki attacks as a specifically Japanese experience. And in doing so, excluded the presence of thousands of colonial subjects who were also subject to those attacks. Um, work uh, by activists in the 1960s into the 70s, 80s, and 90s pushed against this erasure very significantly. And scholarship on that type of activism has really effectively demonstrated the, the ways in which this nationalization precluded the, the, their voices. But my own work tries to basically bring out how there is this um, similar type of erasure that's happening in the Korean context, within the context of population. So let's talk about that context a little bit. Um, so, you know, the, the, the 1945 to 1950 period within Korea is very contentious. Um, I tend to understand it as a product of a twofold process of division. Korea up until 1945 is part of the Japanese empire, a component of it, and had been for decades. With the end of the Asia Pacific War, Korea is no longer um, integrated into that political entity, right? So that's, that's, that's where the story of liberation comes from, but it's a very disruptive process. People at this time have a hard time finding light bulbs and paper, right? Water, ink, simple sort of like biscuit crackers, things that had freely flowed throughout an integrated imperial economy are no longer available. That's the one mode of division 
The second mode of division, which is much more clear, is joint occupation, where the Americans are occupying the south of the peninsula, the Soviets are occupying the north of the peninsula. As probably many of you know, this is supposed to be a temporary arrangement, one that lives on, uh, lived on, later uh, re-manifested itself through division culture, two separate states, and the continued conundrum of, of national division of the Korean Peninsula. It's kind of ABCs of modern Korean history. It's in this context that you have the emergence of a type of post-colonial science culture. From throughout the empire, you have individuals like these, um, a bunch of scientists and engineers, many of them educated in Japan and employed in places like Manchuria or Nanjing or Hanoi, or of course the Japanese metropole itself, returning to the Korean Peninsula, returning to Seoul to take up positions of administration and research. Like those three guys that I started the, the talk with, right? Um, scientific research requires a lot of money, requires a lot of institutional resources. For the most part, they don't have any of that stuff. So um, many of them turn to writing, science writing. Um, between 1945 and 1950, there's a whole slew of magazines that are produced. Um, popular science texts that are geared and aimed towards encouraging the public to bring a type of scientific sentiment into their everyday lives and into their politics. The hope, in, in essence, is to construct a liberated nation off of, off, of, uh, off of the authority of scientific knowledge. And it's in this genre of text that um, you know, I'm able to access the types of discussions about the atomic bombings that, that ground, ground my research and ground my arguments. Um, you know, it wouldn't come as any great surprise to, to know that the publications on popular science are really interested in this new, new uh, vista of science that's been opened up. And so the, the writings on the topic are quite plentiful. And, the vast majority of this writing focuses on the liberatory character of the atomic attacks. Um, and, um, you know, uh, what I'd like to illustrate in this subsection is the plurality of liberations that come to the fore, right? So the first thing, kind of like most common one, is an idea of political liberation. So here we have um, Min Song. This is a not a popular science magazine. I have to apologize to note this is a, a like a general readership magazine. It's one actually the most widely read magazines on the Korean Peninsula in the post nineteen forty five period. This is the first issue of Min Sung, which of course does give an entire centerpiece towards the discussion of uh, the atomic bombings and includes lines like this: "It's fear of racial annihilation brought by this new and powerful weapon." that led to Japan's surrender, right? So they drop the bomb, the Japanese, they give up. Lots of, uh, lots of articles from this time underscore this type of, this type of point, the idea that um, the, the, uh, the national liberation, personal liberation is delivered, delivered by the attacks. But there are other modes as well. So another uh, introduction here we have by Pak Tote, who does a translation of David Dietz's Atomic energy in the coming era. Um, so the translation itself is kind of a hallmark example of atomic utopianism from the 40s and 50s. Kind of think about like stuff you see in the Jetsons or whatever, like um, like rockets, cars, locomotives, airplanes. Like everything's fueled by like a pea-sized piece of uranium. Limitless energy solving all problems. Uh, the book. When we read this stuff, it seems like super campy, kind of funny. Uh, but at the time, the book is actually taken quite seriously. It's published by Seoul National University. It's forward. It's written by the president of the institution. And Pak Tote is no joke himself, right? Um, in his separate writings from this time, he's also incorporating ideas about a topic utopianism to talk about not just national liberation, but uh, liberation of the species, right? I think the era when nations will fight over oil has already passed, right? Oh, you sweet child. <laughs> no, right? No, but you can get the idea, right? Which is that basically, if we had limitless electricity, limitless energy, this was his argument. If we have limitless energy, we can synthesize whatever we need out of like energy and seawater, and there'll be nothing left to fight over, right? It'll be geopolitical liberation, nation aside for all of humanity. Right? The, the argument thus circulates. 
Other accounts uh, that are translated into Korean at this time focus on um, liberation as a function of kind of divine intervention. Um, here we have two John Hershey's Hiroshima and Takashi Nagai's Bells of Nagasaki. Um, both of them were translated into Korean in 1948. It might be the only country in the world that saw these two works meet in this kind of funky way. Um, in each of these works, the story of the atomic attacks is actually narrated as a type of divine event, right? This sort of sudden rupture. Between the two, uh, Takashi Nagai's is the most explicit in this regard. The people of Nagasaki prostrate themselves before God and pray, grant that Nagasaki may be the last atomic wilderness in the history of the world. So um, Nagai's argument is basically that, um, that Hiroshima and Nagasaki are a type of uh, recompense for the sins of the empire, and that by offering these cities up, that there'll be a future of peace. Right? Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's an event that's defined by the relationship with, with a deity. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, Sam, but he looks super duper Catholic in this picture, right? He, di he dies of radiation poisoning a little bit after writing this book as well. He's also, though, a radiologist, right? So he's writing with scientific authority. He's writing with religious authority. And in the 1940s, that type of um, hybridity between the two isn't actually so uncommon, right? But again, this is not a political form of liberation. This is not a material liberation. This is a type of emancipation between humanity's relationship with God, right? Um, you know, folks in the DPRK were less common to talk about things in those light, in that light. Um, uh, the, the kind of final iteration of, of liberation that we can look at is through uh, forms that are, are expressly political in nature. So, Dosan uh, Lok is one of the, the kind of famous physicists who, um, like, part of that previous cohort that returned to the peninsula. He's briefly within Seoul for a few months before going to North Korea, where he sort of rockets to the, to the head of the nascent scientific community there. Um, he writes extensively at this time, and as a physicist, is often dealing with questions of energy and um, atomic, atomic science. A great revolution has arisen in the nuclear of uranium. Um, in his understanding, though, uh, it's, it's basically, uh, you know what, we don't have time. I won't trouble you with it. <laughs> he has a very specific understanding of what energy revolution means. And you'll just have to check out my forthcoming book to read it. <laughs> we'll skip over it. Um, broadly, though, he's associating, he's associating the potentials of the atomic age to specific geopolitical formations. So the argument that is widely circulated in the North at this time is that basically while the Americans made the bomb, only socialist states are going to be able to realize the geopolitical and developmental potential of this technology. Right? A good example of this argument, which Dosan Rok occasionally uses, appears in this, this uh, piece here, which is Neanderthals of the Atomic Age. Right? So guess who the Neanderthals are here? Right? Modern, the modern Neanderthals are at all levels of society holed up in their caves. They have no objections to using the atomic bomb or other weapons of slaughter they have at hand for the profit. And at the same time, they fear its use for technological and peaceful ends. Um, so the end of the Americans, right? And the idea is that, uh, in, in effect, the, um, the developmental potential, the revolutionary potential of atomic technology will never be realized in a type of uh, liberal or capitalist society. There'll always be pushback, right? The fossil fuel companies, or, or the, the iron trusts. Um, they'll always resist the potential of this technology um, because of their own systemic intrinsic orientation, I guess. So, so, so in a sense, they're imagining someone like, I don't know, like in America, you have these senators from like Tennessee or, or West Virginia, and they're just like, we need coal, we need it. We need it, we need it, we we'll always need it. And they apply any number of levers within the political machine to basically result in an outcome that results in coal consumption. This is their critique as well, that only socialism is going to realize the potential. Integrating it with ideas about political revolution and liberation along those lines. Ah, it's one of those things, you get really deep into the archive, 
you start to like fall in love with your materials and you're like, look at this image. It's going to be so great to talk about it. And I'll tell you guys about it. You'll laugh and I'll feel good. And well, <laughs> they have a lot of ideas about, basically this is a North Korean image. It's about Churchill because we're in England, you know, and so we're, I don't know what you call this island. We're in the British Isles, UK. We're here, we're in London, right? And this is Churchill. The idea in effect is that basically there are all sorts of ways that within the socialist sphere, people managed the creation of atomic technology by the Americans. And one of the ways to manage it is that aforementioned argument to say that they'll never be able to actually use it in a progressive way. The other way is to focus on this idea of kind of like uh, the paper tiger or the inflated threat. The nuclear weapons actually aren't too geopolitically useful. Um, and so we, we see that sort of demonstrated here um, that, that yeah, the bomb has no sort of use that's it's kind of just an inflated, inflated mannequin of a, of a source of power. So those, those collection of accounts focusing on liberation, right, are all, are all consistent, at least in their end conclusion, that um, regardless of the cost, the invention of this new type of technology, the, the discovery of this new mode of energy is, is progressive um, by whichever met metric you examine. This is one way of looking at it. Another distinctive way, though, of understanding the emergence of, of atomic technology at this time is to frame it within the experiences of the recently ended war. So, um, this is where we kind of encounter what's called science war, science war discourse. Um, it finds its origins well before 1945 within the context of the Japanese empire. Early um, Japanese accounts of the First World War uh, actually tended to understand that event as a point of, um, an instance of conflict that's determined by science and technology in particular. Science war discourse essentially uh, argued that, um, you know, the world is made up of these actors, these states, each of them have individual kind of scientific and technological attributes. In instances of war, it's actually not a question of economies or of armies, it's a question of science, science battles. And then the winner is the one with the best science, right? Uh, we find different illustrations of this idea the one in the middle starting from the 1930s. This is, this is the Science Museum Bulletin. Um, the, actually the first, sort of regarded to be the first Korean language popular science magazine also frequently forwarded this view and then a, a later one from 1945. So a version of this idea that appears in that, that earlier issue that we're talking about by a really famous popular science writer named Andong Hyok. The victory of the war is a victory of science. The world's scientists were brought together and nothing spiritual or material was spared for the research. This is America's victory and the establishment of the world. Right? So you get the outline of that idea. Um, did you get it? Take it. Give me a second. It's a nice picture of it. I haven't got it yet. Okay. <laughs> Just the... Uh... Otherwise, you know what? I can just send it to you after the talk. Should we okay. do that? No. Sounds good. So, um, Andong Yok, you know, is generally understood to be type of uh, good, like liberal, academic, maybe bordering on the conservative. I, I don't want to put him in a box, but basically he stayed in Seoul and never goes to Korea um, and continues to write well into the, well into the 50s and 60s. Um, but we do have folks who are, are more aligned with uh, the, the socialist or Marxist movements at the time. Yun Heng Jun is an example, an economist, as a matter of fact, who contributes to the popular science magazine, A Science for the Masses, in 1946. Um, in his accounts as well, though, of, of the Asia Pacific War, he focuses on the role of science. One look at this unprecedented conflict and it shows that science it shows that it was a science war and that the Allies' great victory was won on that front. There's a whole bunch of histories of defeat, right, that emerge after 1945. Not surprisingly, right? where Korean authors and translators are grappling with the experience of the Asian Pacific War and trying to come up with accounts for why the war went the way it did. And these also frequently focus on the role played by science and the outcomes. These are really um, particular works because on the one hand, you'll have forewords that are written by Korean authors 
but it's a kind of a, a bricklage of translations from Japanese texts, from American texts, from Russian texts, all brought together into this kind of meta narrative of uh, the empire's defeat and the allies' victories. This, again, as I said, will we'll fixate on the question of science and technology and the role played there. Um, a lot more to be said about it, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe leave it at that. The general sort of logic, though, of a science war argument results in some particular conclusions. Um, and one of them we can say, we can see right here. It's just like the Americans said, the outcome of Japan's defeat is actually their liberation from oppression and feudalism. And for that reason, the burden of the war is actually a happy thing for Japanese people. So um, it, this is kind of a funky statement, but we can think through it a second. So science war is basically polities. The theory of it, right, is that polities are duking it out with their individual systems of science. And, and like, if you win and I lose, your science is better than mine. But guess what? I, if I don't get killed, I get to enjoy your science, right? And so even the Japanese now have liberation through science available to them. Right? It's a happy thing the outcome of the war. It's a very kind of bizarre twist where the former colonizer is also able to enjoy liberation, right? But it's not a twist in understanding the role of science in society. Right? It's just that um, you know we're looking to new vistas, maybe Washington or Moscow, as a source of, of developmentalist authority. So we have all these kind of accounts of emancipation, right? Political emancipation, religious emancipation, revolutionary emancipation. Emancipation through warfare. The, the through line in all of it, though, is this consistent discussion of liberation. And, and in a sense, that, that just that, that tracks, right? That makes sense. It's, it's Korea, it's 1945, 46, 47, right? It, you're, you're living in a society that's defined by the politics of decolonization. And so these ideas about science and technology fit really well with the overall climate and mood of the day. Um, and it, it's within that broader discursive climate that we have a type of silencing of stories that don't fit. And one of those types of stories um, are accounts by Korean atomic bomb survivors. Right? So, um, you know, it's one of those things where you like, you know, it's there somewhere, but you can't find it. Um, so empirically, like we have rough numbers, right? There's 70,000 Koreans in Hiroshima and Nagasaki on the days of the attacks. And of these 40,000 are killed, 30,000 survivors, 23,000, it's estimated return to the Korean Peninsula, right? I think about 7,000 go to the north, the rest go to the south. And so as a historian, you're kind of looking at those numbers that were generated later on, right? By the, in the 80s and the 90s, we talked about earlier that Korean atomic bomb activists, those movements where they're trying to get into the story, have their voices included. Um, empirically, we know that they're there, the period that I'm looking at. I can't find their accounts. And you, you, digging around, you're looking, you assume that it's somewhere. Um, I, so I don't want to be like definitive. I spent a long time looking for Korean atomic bomb survivor accounts from right between 45 and like 60, and I found two. One of them is super short, and the other one is this piece right here. So maybe they're out there. Maybe one of you will find it. If you do, send me an email <laughs> or, or write, a, write, a, write a rejoinder. I don't know. Um, a significant one, though, a widely circulated one is this one. Um, Hiroshima's last day. So Hiroshima's last day was published shortly before the start of the Korean War um, in uh, Sinjanti, which before the cult was uh, really like <laughs> widely circulated uh, general readership magazine, one of the most popular in the in the pre-Korean War period. Um, and it's and it's an account of the bombings written by. Uh, a Korean survivor who writes under the pseudonym Student Y. So 
uh, it's a collection of memories and of scientific accounts dealing with the, uh, the experience of the bombings. And it's one that both undermines some of the binary logic between colonial, colonial power and colonized, and one that also questions some of the, the temporal understandings of liberation. And this guy's not optimistic about the future, um, to, to say the least. So the account itself opens with student Y at home on the morning of the blast. And it, it kind of follows a lot of the sort of um, narratives of the atomic bomb that were produced at this time, sort of attention to the minutia of a household thrown into disarray, searching for family members, trying to, you know, going from the assumption that your home was destroyed to the realization that the whole city was destroyed, right? These features are all present in Student Wise account. Um, the, the kind of collective shock that, that the bombings solicit, right? The, the faces of surprised and shocked neighbors or um, the, the, the sight of a, a group of soldiers who are caught in a flash with their shirts off, um, or the fires that follow the bombs, or the, the fires that follow the bombings, or the embers that are the size of fists. All of these populate the early, early sections of Student Wise account. Um, and he, he repeatedly depicts you know, survivors in kind of grotesque or non-humanistic form ways. So uh, he'll often describe, you know, burn victims as looking as, as, as if they're goblins, right? um, or he'll emphasize how the trees are kind of like doing a dance macabre. Yeah. Um, and the story itself, student wise kind of moving around a lot, like he's, he's in the city for the blast, and then he goes to a nearby village. Um, like many survivors to, to escape, the, you know, to find shelter, to find refuge. And then he returns to the city later on. So the, the narrative follows that, that movement. Um, midway through the article, this very kind of personal and, 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 and a reportage type of account does a big shift. And that shift is informed by the arrival of scientists and researchers in the city. So, so people like those three aforementioned Korean scientists, this broad pilgrimage by scientists and researchers, that also appears in Student Y's story as well. Um, and it's a moment in the account where he starts to talk about radiation. So halfway through the story, he starts to provide information about the effects of radiation, the ways in which uh, radiation burns would, would affect individuals depending on their proximity to the, the center of the blast. Um, he provides a broad introduction um, along those lines, borrowing from the voice of scientific authority to talk about biography itself. But it's also at that moment where the question of Japan's defeat emerges. So to quote from the story, university professors from Tokyo and Kyushu, along with chemists, physicists, doctors, and newspaper reporters, all gathered in Hiroshima and started to produce interim reports. It was around the time of Japan's surrender and the end of that tedious war that until then healthy people started to die miserable deaths of radiation poisoning. So it's significant that radiation in the story appears at that moment, that it's at the moment of liberation in Student Y's account, the end of that tedious war, that radiation comes to stage both through the death of people and also through the arrival of scientific authority to decode radiation, decode it as a mystery. And in student wise account, radiation is often displayed not as kind of like this facet of science, but it's written about almost like a person or a character itself. So um, another quote when they're in the village, right? Starting on the 28th, a strange dead body started to visit our village. At every home there were people affected by burns and wounds. Yet after coming to the village, even those healthy people fortunate enough not to be harmed by the bombings, ran randomly began to lose their hair, bleed from within, grow pale, and die. So surrounded by death in this very particular way, uh, student Y starts to take on a kind of uh, affected and frustrated tone, right? 
by a fluke, we avoided death on that day, but we don't know when we're gonna die. Right? Like, we never know when we're gonna die though. But the, 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 point, the point that he's bringing out here is that while many writers, many of his contemporaries are looking at a future of revolution or <laughs> liberation of many different brands, for lots of atomic bomb survivors, the question is when is the other shoe going to drop? Right? Um, it introduces some like temporal angst that is really out of step with broader culture of the time. And it expresses itself often in the politics that student Y brings to the fore. Uh, there's more to be said. So later in his later in his uh, in his piece, he writes, "What would have happened if Japan had not surrendered?" From city to city, atomic bombs would have continually been dropped. Tokyo, Osaka, Kyoto, Kobe. In this way, most lives would be lost to the atomic bomb disease. Only an extremely small number of individuals would remain. Through this kind of process of fate, could these survivors really bring the nation back to life? Okay. It's a funny comment to make in writing in Korean, in a Korean journal read by Korean audiences in 1950. What nation is he talking about? in that piece, right? Um, in other parts of the end of Student Wise account, he vocalizes frustration of the lack of government funds for atomic bomb survivors. And that's actually Japanese government funds, right? And a concern about the overall well-being, not of national subjects, but of atomic bomb survivors. Okay. It's an unclear type of political position. I, it's actually one I can't quite make sense of. I'll, I'll take your question afterwards if I could. Um, right? It's not clear to me if it's interpolation or a type of voluntary type of, of solidarity. Right? A student why still a colonial subject when he's irradiated like that? I never, I actually don't know what to make of it. But, but it stands out clear and it is a very clearly out of step with a broader understanding of post-colonial kind of politics where like we've been liberated and the Japanese are now separate, you know, former colonizers, separate to embrace their fate. So, you know, broadly, is there a slide after this or not? Yeah, okay, conclusion. So broadly, I guess like, First, like, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and just sort of reiterate that broader point, which is that like, um, we can understand the, the, the temporary kind of mid-century disappearance of Koreans from early atomic bomb accounts as being a byproduct of a kind of post-war order where the Japanese with new American patrons are really eager to forget about imperial legacies, to nationalize the history of the atomic attacks, and to understand the new alliance between the United States and Japan along those lines. And it's really clear in a number of different ways that, that this is something that was sought after and politically pursued. And it's not my scholarship, that's kind of like what the field concluded, that was my starting point. Um, but it's also clear that there's something else at work domestically within Korea, where there is a culture of aspiration looking towards the future, looking towards liberation, that's understanding the attacks in certain ways, and that doesn't provide um, voice for, for folks whose experiences don't fit, right? Um, I, you know, understand this to be, in a sense, a lost opportunity, right? Because, um, you know, this is the cusp of a Cold War culture of developmentalism and aspiration for tomorrow. This pursuit over developmental success, this chasing after the laurels of science, right? So much of what characterizes the politics of development, the politics of scientism, the politics of the Cold War is predicated off of this conflation between science and liberation, this apolitical force of universal power and emancipation. Right? Now, these individuals are very clearly stating that this is not what's happening, right? They've been irradiated, like something's wrong with them, and they don't know what, they don't know when they are going to die. Um, one kind of broad conclusion that I try to reach in this piece. The other is just the broader salience of early Cold War cultures of the atomic age in Korea. Hey, these, these, you know, they all kind of like settle into kind of these leisurely careers of pop-sci writing. And that kind of seems like, oh, that's probably where your career is going to end then. 
Not at all, right? The individuals who are writing these sorts of things in the late 1940s end up having pretty significant careers of administration by the late 1950s and early 1960s. So Do Sang Rook, for example, goes on to become um, foundational in the establishment of North Korea's sort of institutionalized atomic research institutes, right? He's often, in the 1990s, he was referred to as the, the father of the North Korean nuclear weapons program. Likewise, Park Jeo-jae, after writing, kind of translating David Dietz's work and saying all this kind of wacky stuff about like, you know, atomic utopianism, he goes on as well to, to head up the, the South Korean Atomic Research Institute that's established in, in the late 50s as well. So these ideas that are formulating, that are you know, percolating within print culture of Korea um, in the post-liberation period also you know, stretch beyond it. And can maybe, for those of you who are like, not interested in any of this stuff and just interested in kind of broad geopolitical questions, can be helpful in framing how we think about the present issue of nuclear proliferation in Korea today, right? It, it's plugging into a much deeper and complex history of science and liberation. It's not just simply sort of like uh, political actors waking up one morning and deciding like, oh, I want to build a nuclear bomb. Like, what, 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 can, what can we do to make that happen? Um, so th this, this, is, this is one of the kind of broader, um, broader conclusions that I try to reach in, reach in my work. Um, so, you know, there's probably more that could have been said at certain points, but this is, I think, a good point to wrap it up. And so um, I thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any, any questions you might have, thank you. Thank you. Right, yeah, we have time for the questions and, and so on. I'm just gonna, I might station myself over here in case there are any good questions from the yeah. uh, there. Okay. Right, so yes, there's a first question. Well, I know the intro problem to the Antitals. Uh, yeah, <laughs> did you get it? Yeah. No, I, I have the full thought to say. Um, I have two questions. One is in when after the, the, the bombs were exploded, uh, the Yankees, I use the expression, I think differentiate the, the perpetrators from Bolivians, Brazilians, Cubans, <laughs> Canadians. 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 Yeah. <laughs> and that and uh, um, they were claiming that uh, people who died simply died from the bomb blast or from the heat. Uh, there was an Australian journalist, Wilfred B. Merchant. Um, who actually got into uh, uh, the devastated area and was seeing the, 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 the symptoms, uh, the, the dreadful symptoms of these people. And he managed to get into a press conference when he returned to Tokyo um, to, to uh, denounce, uh, you know, the, 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 the lies that were being told. So my first question is, <clears throat> when did the knowledge of this special way of death uh, reach Korea. <laughs> First question. The second question is about the Japanese surrender. Um, in your talk, you mentioned that uh, you know the bombs were dropped and then they surrendered. But the Japanese actually offered to surrender beforehand on worse terms than they were eventually offered. And the conclusion that many people have is that um, the bombs were dropped as, as a warning towards the Soviet Union at the time, of course, an, an ally. And then the other, and a more general point, talk, talking about one of the, the, the more general themes of your talk. Um, I've just come up from Slovakia, and every town, almost every village in Slovakia, there are memorials to the Red Army and to a liberated uh, country from the Nazis and partisans who, who also are uh, national uprising against Nazism. Um, I, I would. Ted more attention with the view that the Second World War uh, was not won well, nearly by technology, but by, by the people, um, oh, yeah. who gave their lives in millions. Uh, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I should disaggregate my kind of view of the science war from what they're talking about. So um, I, I also agree that basically wars aren't decided by scientific prowess. Vietnam War would be a great illustration at that point. Um, so it's simply a broader assumption, though, about the relationship between science and geopolitics, and then the importantly, the relationship between the nation and science. So the assumption that basically, like, oh, Canada is a country, and in the same way that Canada has an army, there's Canadian science, this thing called Canadian science. 
which is of course absurd, right? Like scientists, scientific knowledge, even in a place like North Korea, if you look at journals from the late fifties, right? You go to their footnotes, you see the degree of cross-pollination that those scientists are engaging in the, 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 the types of circulation of knowledge. So um, I, I'm with you with that. With that. The, um, the earlier sort of um, questions about the, the, the decision to use the bombs and the politics around that, so there's a vast library of literature on it. Um, and and of, of, of course, like the, the I, you know, I think what, what is pretty, so it was pretty clear is that basically they are like, it's in a sense, the decision was made in like 41, right? Like when they started, right? They just, it's like this machine starts to turn and you know, that there's no stopping it. They like, it, it like and if you look at the logic of the aerial bomb like the aerial warfare campaigns that were already set out by 42 and 43 that that it it's sort of taking on a life of its own that that's maybe beyond geopolitical intervention it's found by Consborn and, and his um i think it was Consborn and his view of the the, the start of the second the first world war yeah i read it if it maybe we're different from the same well um the the final question though about the empirical question about radiation yeah. like when do people know what? So that, that's actually a great question, one that I've struggled with, basically sooner than we thought, much sooner than it's generally accepted. So one of the reasons why atomic bomb survivors don't want to talk about their experience actually doesn't have anything to do with the broader sort of assumptions about erasure that I'm suggesting. So they thought people wouldn't want to marry them because they get home and there's like, yeah, I was in Hiroshima during the bomb dropping, that this concern that they wouldn't be able to find spouses. Deep shame on her. Right, so these these sorts of dimensions that are already percolating at the level of the village. In, in 1946, there's rumors about radiated rice circulating in the peninsula. The Americans have their own rumors that there's a Japanese atomic bomb in like Wonsan and that the Russians got it, so that the Russians have a bomb because of the Korean, like the- in fact, is where they- like, There was not a man, there was, there was a- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. Yeah, yeah, the Kansas City Gazette or something breaks the story, right? So you have all this kind of broad angst and anxiety that's connected to weapons, to radiation, to radiation. And, and this is all prefaced by understandings about what this technology is going to do, right? Um, the first article about an atomic bomb that I ever read was published in like 1939, right? When it was theory. And so the, the ground is kind of set for that sort of any, any other questions? Yeah, one question there, and then perhaps did you do you have a question? Oh, yeah, I'm here. So we could take maybe take like two or three just That's quick great. questions. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my grandfather was actually um, a general in the British Army, and he was stationed in the Allied occupation of Japan. Yes. Yeah. And um, a number of points come into play in relation to the references that you gave, um, just with regard to the letters. Um, detailing other cities that would be um, atomized if uh, the Japanese didn't. So, um, is this actually um, documentable in reference to the Allies? And the reason I ask that is because there is evidence to suggest that Nagasaki and Hiroshima were uniquely dispelled of any conventional weaponry precisely because yeah. they had been earmarked for yeah. atomization. Yeah, yeah. And of course, that wouldn't have worked if they would have then carried on atomizing the rest of Japan because they wouldn't have been getting the science. And the science is also, or the scientific idea, is also reinforced by, um, you know, some of the kind of Churchillian references, because, you know, there's suggestions that he would imagine that the Japanese had some kind of biological specification that was radically different to the rest of us, you know, uh, referring to them as ants in a way, you know. Um, and the other part, which is kind of connected, is also that um, during the Allied occupation, the very notion of having medical conditions or any kind of biological effects of radiation or atomization is precluded because it's against the press code.
to actually have any information and describe your condition. Anybody who wanted to describe their condition or their circumstances only could only do it retrospectively. They couldn't do it prospectively. I mean, yeah. to give an example of this, a shocking example, an example which I've never met a single person who knows, but this is documented in the Hiroshima archives. A girl who was about eight years of age was traveling to school on the train in Hiroshima. And as she stepped on the train, her brother was a step ahead of her and she watched him being captured by the flash and watched him melt away. And in her letters, she asked the question, she's still wondering, and by this time she's well into her adulthood, she's still wondering whether at the time when he was melting away, was he feeling any pain? And of course she couldn't address that issue at the time because it was unlawful. Yeah, so I'm gonna, yeah. there's a lot to like say about this, um, but like, so that we can kind of get a core, like think that, because there's a lot to follow up on. Yes, yeah. Uh, well, almost, you know, um, are there any accounts by the Queen's local range? Um, uh, I don't know what the question is. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I had a similar sort of question. It was kind of slightly, um, maybe slightly kind of like, but have you considered? I mean, I'm sure you've considered everything because you've been hunting through the archive, archives, but you know, Korean accounts of Japanese, there are none of those either. I mean, that, that's quite astonishing, really, that there are no Korean accounts of Japanese. Mm -hmm. Any, I suppose. Uh, about to ask kind of a similar question. Like, last question is kind of like how persuasive is this kind of like official discourse of science and liberation when I think like in your paper you also mentioned like in student wise account that those affected by the radiation did want to uh, look to science to like answer uh, you know like why they were suffering from radiation poisoning and like on the same point kind of like following from you I'm kind of wondering like you know because of like this dominant nationalist discourse that was kind of like denouncing collaborators, especially with the Japanese, um, that would have prevented like maybe publications uh, or writings by people like Student Y, except in like magazines like the Shichonji uh, magazine. So like, is, is there like possibility of looking into like non-archival sources, like oral streets or interviews with survivors? Yeah, yeah. so um, in this question line, we'll work, we'll work our way back. So. Um, basically, um, I'm actually not convinced that student Y is in Korea when he's writing this. I think he might be signing to Japanese or Korean just in Japan itself. That, that's actually quite impossible. Um, I, I don't know. I can't figure that part out. Um, in, in terms of kind of proliferation of accounts, so it's, um, there, there, eventually there's a ton of accounts, right, that are produced both by folks in Japan. A, a lot of the political interventions that we're talking about in the 60s are, in 70s are, are led by, by Zainichi, Koreans in Japan. Um, the, the accounts, though, that tend to be more broadly translated and circulated are produced a little bit later. And I was really looking for things that were produced in the kind of context of this broader conversation that's circulated. And so I, I think, you know, the sources like diaries or letters where maybe it's there, if I could find it or if I was harder working or something, I could get it maybe, but it wouldn't be circulating in the way that I wanted to see kind of circulation of knowledge and ideas um, in kind of this broader popular, um, in this broader popular cultural sense. Um, I, I, I think they're probably, I think they're out there, um, but I, I wasn't able to put them down. Um, I think maybe that kind of captures the, the, the question about narratives by uh, Koreans who are in Japan, um, but it maybe leads into a broader question, which is one of censorship. So there is like a, just a ton of writing in Japan about the experience of the bombings, and it's automatically having political implications. Um, it's really interesting to see the ways that the Americans censored this and often um, shape the contours of the discourse of bombings, which they did in a number of ways. Um, but the, the one that stands out most clearly to me is through paper, allocation of paper. So generally when I think about censorship, it's like, okay, get out my marker and just like, you know, cross stuff out. May not say that, may not say that. But the way that the Americans controlled this course was there's a huge paper supply throughout the Japanese empire already like 1942 and 1943, and it continues after the post-liberation period, the Americans roll in with just like their stuff, 
got a lot of it, including paper, and they choose which kind of works are going to go into mass publication. So it's not always the case that these narratives that maybe are telling stories that are highly critical of the bombings don't make it to press. It's just that they don't make it to press in a considerable enough amount to shape a popular discourse. That's certainly the case with Takashi Nagai. Right? His account, why did this happen? Divine will. <laughs> like, we, we, we were really bad. We were really bad during the war, and we should like pay recompense. That was clearly supported by the Americans through allocation of paper, right? going into translation. So um, that that's um, yeah, and maybe it doesn't hit every every nail that's brought up by your like, questions. But yeah, leave it at that. Yeah, more questions, please. Yes. Uh, just a really quick one, and I'm sure you mentioned, um, and I just missed it. But what year was Student Wise Writing published? 1915. This is right before the war started. Uh, it's in a special issue about the atomic age. So it's uh, mostly of translated texts and pieces by basically science writers, um, which are again not not uncommon. I um, the 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 in my own research, I think the frequency of discourse on this new body of science and technology was striking. There was a lot more of it than I expected. And the creativity translation stood out, that kind of mixing translations, bending them, putting in a lot of editorial oversight. Uh, some of the earliest introductions to radiation followed the, the tests, uh, the bikini tests. Right? Did uh, the disorganizers change after the um, Soviet first point test in 1949? Is the, the extreme bargain response to that? So, would it have changed after American Fairman or? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know how student wise story itself would have changed um, after 49. I think um, the 49 event is interesting because actually, well, 49 is kind of this like, it's like a moment of faith, right? So Truman never thought that, Truman didn't believe it. <laughs> Famously, I think even into his retirement, he sort of said like, I'm not even sure they even have these weapons, right? Um, the 49 test very famously is announced by the Americans, right? because they're doing flights between Hokkaido and Alaska, and they have these Geiger counters, and they're, they're picking up isotopes, and they come to this conclusion. So Truman announces it even before Moscow does. And so this is, in a sense, kind of the, the big coup or one of these big sort of PR events in the Cold War. But Truman's message is actually no news to report here, right? We knew this was going to happen all along. It's not a surprise, blah, blah, blah. And we need to panic. Um, Early introductions to that term Cold War in Korea come well before 1949, and it's predicated off the belief that if the Soviets don't have this weapon now, they'll soon have it. So it, I, I don't think it actually, that year itself, would change the discourse radically. Right? Um, I'm, I'm curious about so all these uh, South Korean um, science magazines, to what extent were they political in the sense that they would say, would they say things like, Korea should have nuclear weapons because then they won't be attacked, or should we, you know, be more better friends with the U.S. or, or something like that? How political are? Yeah, I always forget this. So everyone thinks that they should have nuclear weapons, <laughs> even in Korea today, South Korea today. Like the idea of having nuclear weapons is not profoundly unpopular. Um, it, I think it's it's always polled as a pretty like not a bad idea. Oh, it can be kind of delicate issue. Uh, in the 1940s and late 1940s, early 1950s. The idea of having nuclear weapons was often uh, suggested as a question of sovereignty, the viability of national sovereignty itself. Without these weapons, how can we ever stand on our own two feet? It's funny because like Churchill thought the same thing. He was just like, oh man, we need to get this immediately, right? Um, so in terms of that specific question, there's a, there's a kind of a broad consensus that the, for the nation to basically prosper and succeed, <laughs> They need this new body of science and technology. They need some science and technology in general. In terms of the question of politics, it's very tricky. Um, there are, so yeah, they're all very political. Um, I think there were, in the immediate 1945, post 45 context, you have like the people's committees, right? And there's people's committees that form 
in laboratories and in research institutes, and they start to produce these magazines. And some of them take different political orientations, right, and engage in politics in different ways. Um, some of them just move north um, wholesale. Uh, and there's there's a there's a body that also basically take the most sort of political position of all, which is to say, like, we're not political. <laughs> we're not politically engaged. We have no interest in politics at all, right? Um, which, of course, are the ones that survive into 1949 and 48. But the, the, the notable thing about um, the kind of pop science literature at this time is that it, it kind of explodes into, inside of Seoul. And then by 1948, as the Civil War violence starts to really take root, it emerges in the North. And so you kind of have this blossoming of writing in the South, and it diminishes, and then this reemergence of writing in the North. And there's authors that are starting in one place and moving to the other. Uh, I guess you knew, you, you knew that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, and it, just a quick comment. It's interesting this thing about you know countries wanting to have nuclear weapons. Because I mean, we, we sort of I think we kind of forget that we live in the post NPT age, where right? the age of non proliferation, which becomes a thing that is a, is a norm, right? You know, and, and that comes what late 60s, 70s. But before that, I mean. So many countries had a nuclear weapons program. Right? Yeah, Switzerland had a nuclear weapons program. I assume it was fairly advanced. I mean, <laughs> Italy had Italy had a nuclear weapons program. I mean, you could probably count, you know, I think some of the Scandinavian countries as well. But um, we live in this sort of later period of, of the M MPT, in which sort of uh, in, in which the idea that there's a club of only a few countries which should have nuclear weapons and everyone else doesn't is kind of the norm. I hope that's yeah. Yeah. And so, so nuclear proliferation up. Oh. A historically grounded understanding of North Korean nuclear proliferation has to have that in mind. That you know, you'll be looking at a student, like Seoul Day, like student, student society, like magazine from like 1949, and they'll have like a they'll have a cartoon, right, of campus life, what's happening. And in the corner, there'll be this like crestfallen student working on an atomic bomb project, right? As a joke, right? But it, it, the idea of proliferation isn't something that pops into Kim Il-sung's head one day, right? It's, it's kind of everywhere, this idea, like, for us to be sovereign, we need to have it. Uh, there's great rumors that, like, Korea is like an uranium-rich country that, um, that it could be uniquely endowed with, with nuclear weapons. This idea is really so it's just a super quick question. Like, so the climate around, like, scientific progressivism is kind of like all centered around like atomic technology and you know, uh, this kind of science. And a lot of that isn't about like nuclear weapons necessarily, right? A lot of this science is about like the other uses of like, the atom. Like how much of that is actually published in scientific magazines, obviously, but how much of that was actually uh, founded? Like how much of that actually came into being later on? Uh, these proposed uses of the atom. Yeah, I mean, well, Korea has a very active nuclear our sector, I think 30% of their energy comes from it. Um, but um, the, yeah, I mean, the, the, the broad kind of focus in a lot of these works is energy, right? And I didn't really mention in the talk, but for Do Sang-ro, it's, it's not, he's in North Korea, he's identified with Marxist politics, but if you like get into the fine print of how he understands historical transformation, he doesn't think it's class struggle, he thinks it's like energy revolutions from coal to oil. To electricity to atomic power, and uh, it's linear and it's it's techno deterministic. Um, how I mean, um, in the in the short term, the realization of all these potentials by the late nineteen fifties is mediated through Cold War relationships. So the you know whatever types of you know irradiated fruit or like the, the cutting edge x-ray machines are all coming either through relationships with the Americans or the Soviet Union or, or within those broader Cold War spheres. It's where you see that tension over science, this, con this contest over continued developmentalism in a Cold War context. Thanks. A slightly like off, off piste sort of comment or thought that just came into my mind when I, when I was listening to you you know uh, how much the Bill Bockenheimer is is just returning entirely to the science war thing. Right? It's, I, it's, yes, it's the narrative. I, I haven't really thought about it at the yeah. time, you know, but it's entirely that. Yeah, the Second World War was determined by a bunch of clever guys in you know yeah. in the US and a bunch not, of clever guys in Germany fighting it out. Yeah, uh, we're on a Yeah, um, and uh, 
and the, and, the, and the clever guys in the US, many of whom happen to be exiles anyway, but you know, they were the ones who, who won out um, in, that, in that competition. And it's just a science war, basically. That's, that's one way of reading what I bring up. Yeah, indeed. Um, so, in, in uh, like, insofar as it's kind of cool for like a big movie to be made about the thing you're researching it's fun to watch but insofar as you're interested in historiography of science it's it's a bit of a tough pill to swallow because it's not just that it's basically focused on the individual intervention of one guy it's um within science historiography you kind of have it's it's rough it's kind of rough and ready but there's an idea of like little science or big science big science is defined by kind of corporate or state capital heavy institutional heavy interventions in research and then little science is kind of like you know these edison like people tinkering around in their like in their workshops and the one sort of project that epitomizes the shift from little science to big science again this is really broad strokes it's actually funny but that shift is the manhattan project so for the story to be told about this idea decisive intervention of Oppenheimer as this sort of unique misunderstood genius is uh it's like a kind of really historiographically off the mark um and it also conveying some of the politics that you observe and also it was it was criticized precisely for the erasure of, of, of Japanese victims I mean not, yeah. let, let alone Korean victims but yeah. it, was, it was it was criticized quite a lot for that particular yeah. erasure which again is just a really kind of retrograde sort of feels like a really retrograde Picture of the whole topic, yeah. And with them, um, so um, you know, in the early chapter of of the Cold War, in those first years, there's this broad idea about scarcity. There's not a lot of weapons, and there's this idea that there's actually not a lot of uranium. It's like this real proper rare earth. That's why the rumors of a Korean uranium supply were like hot news for a short period of time. They thought they couldn't find it anywhere else in the world except for like Canada and like you know parts of parts of um parts of parts of Africa and then um the understanding of the weapon was framed more by that broader campaign of aerial warfare right the aerial bombings and the the violence that prefaced the usage of the weapons itself which is just completely unbridled. We have a last opportunity for any, any any final question before we wrap up. Um, good. I take it everyone is, is is good and satisfied. So let's 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 thank Eric once again. <laughs>